Data integrations. They're the best. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, my name is Chuck This is a talk about data integrations. We can't really go super deep in 15, 20 minutes. So, we're just going to go high level. We're just going to cruise. Uh, we'll try to keep it tactical, do a few pros, cons, things to, to remember, take away. Um, it's really, we're going to focus on infrastructure. There's a lot to integrations, uh, a lot of sort of high level. Why am I moving data? Where is it going? And what's the value of moving it? That I'm going to just gloss over. It's really about mechanically what are your choices and why do you care about which ones are good or bad. Um, so let's start with why do we care about data integrations at all? What's the point of this conversation? Uh, and the answer is that the modern business is a connect the dots exercise. Uh, you never work in isolation, especially with Salesforce. I, I don't think I've really ever seen a Salesforce org that was just a Salesforce org by itself. It's always Salesforce plus something else, uh, a marketing tool or uh, an accounting system or inventory manager. It's always Salesforce and other stuff working in tandem that produces a, a business that's viable. So the integrations are super important. If you, if you don't get the integrations right, then you can't have those interconnected business systems. So that's why we even have the conversation. Um, it would be really great in Salesforce if there was some place I could go to just see it all. All my integrations in one place. If you type it, the integration into the quick find in the setup menu, you even get something that is deceptively looks like it might be that thing. Hey, data integrations, done. Uh, unfortunately, this is just a, a data.com accounting integration. Uh, they, they squatted on the, the name. Maybe, maybe we can take it away from them somewhere. I don't know. But uh, this is sort of the the framework we're working with today. So uh, the conversation right now we're about to have is, is what are your choices for integrating with Salesforce? How do you connect things together? And how are we measuring our options? How do we decide what's good or bad? And the answer is always, it's about context. It's about the situation you're in. Uh, so these are some of the questions that we ask to figure out what we care about in this moment. Uh, so what is about us and our data? You know, what's the data look like? What's the shape? How many records? Where are they going? Is it bi-directional? Uh, what sort of volume and frequency are we talking about? Um, and then beyond that, the actual mechanics of the movement themselves, the, the pipes we're working with, what are the properties of that pipe? Is it something that uh, lives sort of inside of a, a safe space? Is it a third party server somewhere? Um, what does authentication look like and identity information? Uh, is my sharing model respected? That sort of stuff. Um, and then you also get into sort of more uh, higher order behavior and concerns like uh, what sort of error handling exists and if I have a uh, failure with my data sync, can I recover later and get the data back or has it gone forever? Um, and then even beyond that, looking back historically, what moved and when and how did it go? Was it successful? When was the last time this data came in? Is it stale? Is it fresh? I don't know. Uh, and then finally, Bolded, highlighted, all caps, change management is always where these tools start to fall apart. Um, so if the structure of one of these systems changes, or uh, if you, what you need to do changes, if you, if you are deliberately making changes because you've changed your mind or you've gained some new insight into how things need to move back and forth, uh, that plays a, a big role, a big factor in your decisions about what you're going to pick. So we'll just do kind of a, a quick hit on a lot of different things you can do to integrate data with Salesforce, and then we'll do Q&A and probably go a little deeper. All right, so Salesforce is built on APIs. One of the best decisions they ever made early on was to uh, say that everything you could touch in Salesforce was going to be accessible via an API. So almost every integration we're going to talk about today is related in some way to APIs, leverages them somehow. Um, and each API has sort of different values and purposes. I'm not going to go through them all, um, but part of what you're doing or what someone has done for you when they're building these tools is deciding which API is right for the situation. Is it the bulk API? Do I need synchronous or real time? I can use the streaming API because I want to get information across as fast as I can. Is durability important to me? Is redundancy important to me? The ability to recover from errors, that kind of thing. Um, let's dig in. Let's start with inside the stack. So the Salesforce clouds that all fit together. You've seen this picture. Uh, it is deceptive. There's an implication, I think, in this picture that these things all work together really easily. That is, that is not always true. Uh, 
So obviously the core stacks, you know, sales, service, community cloud, are all sitting on the same database and, and work together quite nicely. But when you start bringing in the other things, especially some of the technologies that's been acquired, very different technology stacks, uh, it becomes quite difficult to connect these things together. They're sort of little walled gardens in, in a sense, uh, with varying degrees of success. So Heroku, you've got Heroku Connect, Pardot has a, a built-in connector, Analytics Cloud has a few different connectors where you can connect Analytics Clouds to the core stack or to other things. But these are each kind of done in isolation, right? The, there's not a common way to do it. It's not like these, uh, like the Heroku Connect behaves the same way the Analytics Cloud connects to things. It's not like a, a centralized bus for these things to communicate. Um, so each one of these sort of has to be sort of handled on their own. Um, Commerce Cloud especially, you know, kind of being new is, is one of the trickiest ones to integrate. Uh, pretty challenging right now. All right, so oldie but a goodie. Uh, Apple Messages, who's, who's used these before? Yeah, been around. Uh, so these are sort of empowering admins, right? You can design a, a workflow that's gonna send a message at the end. Uh, so based, uh, one of the nice things about Apple Messages is they're really stable, they've been around for a while, uh, and they're sort of designed to be fairly redundant. They'll continue to retry when they have a failure. Uh, so it's pretty safe to, uh, to build stuff with a, a degree of confidence that it's gonna be able to recover. Uh, it's only soap based, so you can't do rest or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, and because it's not, there's a chance the messages are going to go out of order, and it tries to be resilient, but it's not guaranteed. It's not really a good way to, to build any sort of audit trail. Same thing with the streaming API. Um, you can stream stuff, but it's not super durable. There was some work to make it more durable on platform events, and we're changing that a little bit. But uh, Okay, option number two. You have Apex Web Services and Callouts. Web Services on the way in, Callouts on the way out. Um, Callouts got a big improvement when you added name credentials to the stack. That was a really nice improvement. If you haven't worked with name credentials before, you can define an endpoint that you're going to talk to, an actual URL, and then also credentials, right? So you can use OAuth or uh, like a name principle of some kind and delegate the choice of what server to connect to and what are the credentials to your admin. But you can write code that leverages the connection. So you name the connection and then you let an admin def define the details for you. Uh, so that's generally pretty solid. You get a little, some problems when you start mixing into more complex uh, Apex environments. Anybody ever get this error I have here in red? Ever seen that before? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, that's a nice one, banging your head against the wall. So you can't really just kind of drop this stuff in and it's going to go smoothly the first time. You have to think through what you're doing, you have to think about your execution context and where things live and whether you need to push something into a future in a different execution context. Uh, also, there's Wizzle the Apex for the, on the inbound side. Uh, and that is, uh, your mileage may vary, is what I put on here. It's been around for a long time, it was a great tool when it was first built, hasn't really been loved in a long time. Um, certain whistles work really well, other whistles don't. Uh, if your whistle's sort of a compound whistle and has some complexity to it, it just really can't handle it that easily. Um, so that's a challenge there. All right, Salesforce and Salesforce, uh, been around for a while. This is a way to connect two Salesforce orgs together. Uh, which is something I've seen more and more over time. And this one lives inside the platform, which is nice, not a third party server involved. Uh, it's a little bit tricky to set up, but generally it's pretty solid. Uh, and you can do declarative and programmatic, which is nice, right? So you can use Apex to define links, and then you can also do it declaratively. Uh, one thing that it does not do is transformation. So back to sort of how we're evaluating these different options. Uh, one thing is just to keep records in sync, move records back and forth or, or, or peek into the other system. Another is to do actual transformations and, and change the relationships between records or change the structure of them. Um, so one thing that Salesforce, Salesforce does not do that some of these other tools you can do are, are heavy transformations. Um, and then relationships are really tricky. You actually can't move lookups across the Salesforce or Salesforce connection. You have to copy the ID over as text and try to recombine it on the other side, which is kind of a headache. So Salesforce and Salesforce has kind of a bad rep. Um, and it's just not really known for being super fun to work with. <laughs> All right, the, uh, the tool formerly known as Lightning Connect, formerly known as External Object, now called Salesforce Connect, for the time being, uh, is really one of the, the new contenders for connecting things together with Salesforce, and is pretty darn good these days. Uh, it started out a little bit twinky, right? It was uh, very low volume, you could only read, uh, you couldn't use it in reports, you couldn't write back. And over time, it's gotten progressively better and more complex and more sophisticated. So now you can pull it into reports. Now it can be bidirectional. You can write back to the other direction. Um, the big thing you need to understand about Salesforce Connect, the thing that differentiates it and makes it very different than the other choices, 
almost all of these are about moving records. I actually have a record here, I'm going to replicate it over, and it's going to exist over here now. Salesforce Connect is about peaking. It's about having a window into another database and being able to look at records over there, but not necessarily carrying all of the data back over to your system. Um, and the best use case for that is you have some other system with just a huge amount of data in it, right? You have a, a big order management system and it's got millions and millions of orders in it from years and years of, of back history with customers. And you don't need to pull all those records into Salesforce, but they're still contextually useful. I'm looking at an account. I want to see all the orders that have been placed in that account for the last 10 years. Uh, so you can use something like Salesforce Connect to, add, when I look at the account detail page, I can see uh, all these orders in this other external system alongside my data in Salesforce. Uh, that's, that's super helpful. And another thing that really makes it powerful is the relationship management is done really nicely. Um, so you actually define essentially like a master detail relationship or a lookup relationship for records that are in Salesforce, like my accounts, to these external systems and say, okay, I want to pull in records related. I want to show them in a related list. And it kind of looks like I'm used to seeing the, the connection, uh, but it actually lives elsewhere. I'm not using up data storage to have it in Salesforce. So your takeaway for, for Salesforce Connect is that it's really one of the only ones that doesn't move data. It's a, a window somewhere else, but does a really good job with relationship preservation as opposed to something like Salesforce to Salesforce is terrible relationships. Okay, this one's brand new. Has it, anyone ever heard of this one yet? Not really, no. Uh, so Ralph talked about this at, at TDX this summer. Uh, he and his team are trying to address uh, sort of this gap Right, that exists on the platform of uh, just, it's not really a cohesive way to fit these all together. Uh, so if you thought if you thought of this as sort of the love child of data loader and the import wizard, right? It's got sort of the, the sexy UI, the friendliness of the import wizard, but sort of the mechanical abilities of the data loader. Uh, so it's it's off platform in that it's not in sort of the core stack, the force.com stack, but it's still sort of in the bubble of, of Salesforce land. Um, so sort of more privileged, but not fully privileged. Uh, and the focus early is going to be on CSV. So you know, just basically consuming CSV files and dropping them into Salesforce in a way that's repeatable and friendly. Um, but the, the vision, from what I understand from his talk, was that you can uh, sort of use it in a more broad sense than just on the force.com stack. Right? He's envisioning that it can, it can be more, it can connect to more different things. Uh, I put the link in here, so when I share the deck, you guys can actually watch the session, or it's online. Uh, you can find it. <clears throat> All right, so these are probably the, the newest, biggest, best entry into what you can do with integrations in the Salesforce platform events, getting a lot of buzz right now, and for good reason, because finally, you know, a decade later, enterprise message bus technology comes to the Salesforce stack. I can do publishing and subscribing. I can have channels. Uh, and one of the, the neat features with this is that you can define the message shape pretty easily. If you're used to defining a custom object, defining the messages are the exact same style, right? I define a set of custom fields and their, uh, their data type, and I say these, these are associated, they're going to be a message. And because it's so similar to a custom object, uh, it's pretty easy to leverage it in the way that you leverage custom objects. For example, you can have a trigger on a platform event, just like you would on a custom object. And when a new event's created, you can fire that trigger in Apex and react to it. You can also create platform events from Apex. That's pretty sophisticated. Um, if you're used to really solid sort of enterprise grade message buses, this is not there yet. Um, the limits are pretty low. Uh, there's no real way to do topic subscription if you're used to sort of a JMS style uh, where you can say, okay, I'm going to filter very in a nuanced way with wildcards and I'm going to have this event stream, but all, there are all these metadata sort of things that, that tell me I care about this set of the messages and not this set. It's not really like that. It's kind of a, a binary, I want every message or no messages. Um, it doesn't have that degree of nuance yet that you really look for in a, a really good message bus system, but it's a good start. Uh, and they're doing a lot of work on this, it's gonna get a lot better. So I think that platform bets is gonna replace a lot of the other things that I talked about. Uh, this is really, if you're gonna focus your time and attention to learn about something, focus on this one over the others. Um, a couple things that you need to be aware of, it doesn't support professional edition or group or anything below enterprise. Uh, and it does have a degree of redundancy, kind of like outbound messages does. There's a 24-hour window where it stores messages and you can replay, uh, you can go back in time and grab all the messages since a certain point. So there is some nice durability to it, 
uh, but it's not fully durable. After 24 hours, you, you, you lose all the messages. Uh, so again, hard to build like an audit stream off something like this unless you're really tracking it very carefully with a good uptime. All right, so you guys have seen a, a ton of these, but another popular way to do integrations is one-offs, right? You go to the app exchange and you download the app that does DocuSign or the app that does Eventbrite. Uh, that somebody at Eventbrite wrote, or they hired a PDO to write it, or some kind of combination of the two. <clears throat> and you download off the app exchange, and it lets you synchronize against one system. So the Eventbrite one is pretty good. Uh, we used it last year for some stuff, and you install it into your or you can configure. Uh, we use the opportunity table, or we're gonna use a custom object called Ticket. Um, and attendees are contacts, or attendees are leads. You kind of configure what gets mapped to what. And there's some interfaces to do that. Uh, which is great, and it works pretty well. Uh, but the problem with these types of one-offs is that every single one that gets built is built from scratch. Uh, every, each, each of these groups says, okay, I know the right way to build mappings between custom objects and external objects. I, need to, I know the right way to, to define my auditing so I can see what's going on. Uh, and so they tend to really vary in quality. Some are really solid, some are really weak. Um, Overall, kind of when we're evaluating all these different tools, we talked about change management being a big problem. This, the two ways that these tend to fail, and when I say these here, I mean all types of integrations that have been built, are either uh, the scale changes unexpectedly. You know, you went from hundreds of records, a thousand of records, and now your execution context is hitting limits. Uh, or there's some sort of structural change to the, the metadata on one side or the other that wasn't anticipated. Those are the two big reasons that these things start to fail. Single purpose apps are notorious for failing on those dimensions, right? That, they, that as soon as you're starting to scale big, they just never thought you were going to do it that much and, and they start to fall over. Um, so, kind of one step further is, is middleware, right? An actual sort of formal ETL tool that's going to do data, data loading and pushing, uh, more of a platform approach than a single purpose application. Uh, a ton of these out there. Right, uh, Zapier, if this and that, Informatica, Jitterbit, MuleSoft, um, they're just a huge number. The ones that, that play well with Salesforce tend to fall into one or two buckets. And for some reason, there aren't a lot in the middle. They're either pretty darn simple, uh, geared towards sort of recipe driven, uh, good for users, easy to work with, um, or they're really powerful. Not really a lot in the middle. Uh, so the simple ones are great, but then they start to fall over. Uh, a Zapier had a problem, I don't know if they, they eventually got it more robust, but uh, when you could first use Salesforce and Zapier, you could insert new records, but you couldn't update records. So, okay, I mean, that's good sometimes, but if I can't update records, like, okay, yeah, it's not really anything I can scale with. Uh, on the other side, some of the ETL tools end up being incredibly complicated. Uh, one of them that I saw recently, I won't mention names, uses a plugin for Eclipse to configure it. And Eclipse is already sort of an unwieldy interface, and then they built their own interface on top of it. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff, formulas and statics and constants and all these different things. And I am a professional integration architect, and I was confused listening to this demo and trying to understand the screen that this person was showing about how to configure their tool. I thought, if I don't understand this, how in the world are other people going to understand how to set this thing up? Um, so it, it feels like it's kind of one or the other, but it's a heavy space, there's a lot of stuff to do there. Um, kind of a, a shameless plug for what we do. So I didn't really have a bio slide, and I want to talk a little bit before I talk about this, but uh, I've been doing this a long time, about 10 years, building complex things on Salesforce, and I had a team with me, a group of engineers who've been building sort of individual customer things, and we've been frustrated by uh, the lack of a really co cohesive, singular place to manage, configure, observe all of your data movement with Salesforce and been complaining about it for a long time and finally I thought, okay, you know, put up or shut up. Uh, so last summer we started working on an app to essentially be a framework to let people manage all their integrations in one place on the platform. Uh, so we went to the first cohort of the Salesforce incubator. Uh, so we were, spent five months in San Francisco working out of the incubator office there and trying to, to build this app. We went live on the app exchange called Valence. And basically what we're trying to do is give everyone a, a way to have essentially a platform like these middleware companies are trying to build, but something that's native in Salesforce. So what we did is we built it on the Salesforce stack. It's Sales Cloud, Service Cloud, Community Cloud's on that stack. And so what that means is there's no third party server involved um, and it's, right in your org, so we never see your data. Uh, 
what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to change the way people think about integrations on Salesforce. It's incredibly fragmented. And even if this just prompts a, the right conversation, then I'm happy. Because Salesforce is such a, a robust platform that it's crazy to me that this far along in the development of it, we still don't have a good way to do integrations in one place, right? How many slides have I covered here? Like 17 different ways to do the same thing. Now obviously integrations are complex. It's a complex domain. You can't really reduce it down to simple blocks. But surely there should be some way to have a standardized way to sort of build out all the extensions for it and then observe them. Um, and it's one of the things that's important to me with sort of this framework approach is if you can give developers the power to extend, customize, make it really you know, nuanced, but then pull it back in under an umbrella for admins to work with, where an admin can configure it, set it up, see where it's going on, diagnose it, debug it, um, that's the, the sweet spot, right? It's sort of the blend of the two. All right, so same slide again, which is how are we kind of comparing these things. Um, so we went through a bunch of different individual ways to connect things together, and these are the, the metrics we're measuring them on, right? So some were better for uh, volume, you know, things that leverage the bulk API. Uh, a lot of people will roll their own, that's something like Heroku. So certain things you just can't do in Salesforce. A really good example is if I want to use FTP, and I want to load CSV files into Salesforce on a regular basis daily over FTP. But you can't do FTP in Salesforce, right? So you run up a node server on Heroku, you listen to some FTP server, you pick it up every day, you break down the CSV file that you get every day, and you push it in with the bulk API, or with the REST API, or whatever's convenient for you. Uh, so you kind of mix and match these different tools to get what you want, uh, but it's all a question of context, right? So uh, the big questions are, is it a push-pull, bi-directional? Uh, but if you use these questions to sort of prompt the conversations that you have around these tools, uh, it'll help you kind of get to the, the right ones. All right, so that's it. Uh, Q&A, let's talk about questions, stuff I got wrong, stuff you want to know about, what do you got? Man, people always complain about integrations. <laughs> Go, okay. I don't know, I might have missed it, but you did mention about um, UI integrations. It's not a specific data integration, but I'm visualizing data on a record that doesn't persist in cells. Um, and that still you know, requires a bit of code in cells, but there's another way of integrating, but isn't brilliantly easy without coding it. Yeah. Uh, well, let's write that down a little bit then. Okay. So we've got, uh, what did I mention? Oh, uh, Salesforce Connect, right? So that's kind of a UI integration, right? I've got a related list. I can see some records from external system. Uh, you've got Canvas, right? Which you can use to sort of integrate with an external view. Uh, for a long time, people have done integrations where they just have like a web tab that opens up to another system, right? And you log in at the end of the day, and now you click on the web link throughout the day. Um, you can feed stuff with like URLs, right? You've got that little web link on your detail page that pastes the ID of your Salesforce record. It, like, it's just jams in the URL, you click on it, you go to the other system. So you have been kind of hacking together some UI stuff um, for a long time. But do you have like, a more specific use case that you're no, it, thinking about? I think like, I've kind of used that kind of scenario where it's you know, like matching up with a website where it's got a lot of permissioning and you're providing permissions to a user. But you're visualizing it in sales, but you want to persist those permissions in Salesforce, but you want to have the security of the website. Yeah. On top. The Salesforce Connect is sort of the closest thing, I think, to sort of the, the theoretical ideal of if you can define sort of the virtualization of a, a record, right? You can yeah. say, here's a record, here's its shape, and I'm going to give you the shape to access. Let's say that you had a Salesforce external object defined, and somehow it's easy to, to stick it in various UIs, right? I can make a lightning component against that shape and do something with it. Um, and then you can decouple the external system from the way you're using it as a UI, right? And you can say, okay, well, maybe there's just a switch, whether it's gonna be virtualized or actually stored in Salesforce, some sort of synchronization going on. But if I can, if I can define the movement or the virtualization representation, and then decouple that from the UI piece, um, that would be really powerful. But that, I mean, nothing like that exists, really. I mean, Salesforce Connect is close, but not all the way. And the problem with Salesforce Connect is that 
as soon as you do integrations and you try a few out, you do half and half, things go well, you're like, okay, great, I'm done. And then a month down the road, people go, hey, I don't think it's been running. You go, what? You know, I don't think it's been running for the last month. You go, that, I, that can't be true. And then you go and you look at like last modified dates and they haven't changed. And you think, how did nobody notice that this date is a month stale? The answer is like, there's no tracking, right? Like the integration ran, we thought, and then some of the records changed, we thought, but there's no heuristics, there's no analytics, there's no, hey, this is, the, this is how the job went. So, so that's a big problem. Almost none of these that we talked about today have some degree of tracking, um, which is just critical if you're serious about you know, integrations. All right, thank you much. No else? Thanks, quick, guys. quick one. Well, sorry. Does, does Valance have tracking? Valance does have tracking. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's super important. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, architected for developers, but designed for Avid's use intuitively and has all sorts of bells and whistles. Free trials. <laughs> <laughs> all, right. Any all right. Thanks, guys. Sure.